how important is oxygen oxygenating your work before pitching your yeast? Um, you know, when is oxygen important in the fermentation? And when does it go from being your friend to your enemy in the brewing process? With dry yeast, because we spend so much time putting the, you know, sterols and the way we dry and making sure it has a glycogen and, and the likes, um, you don't need to oxygenate on the first pitch. It's only when it becomes liquid that you're going to want uh, oxygen oxygen in there for when you re-pitch the beer because the oxygen is going to help um, build those sterols, you know, make the yeast nice and, nice and fat so that it's able to, 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 to bug. Um Obviously, too much oxygen is going to oxidate the beer at the start. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be oxygenating at all if you're using dry pitch from a first pitch. It's just if, if you're going to then re-pitch. Um, different oxygen levels for different strains. Again, lager, uh, higher, higher gravities. You want to have a bit higher oxygen in that wort. Um, and, you know, back in the, the, the days when I was in a brewery, we would, we would actually test it because the oxygen is going to be absorbed in the first couple of hours. So then you can test if, if there's any oxygen there in the beer. Um, you can also test how much oxygen is, is going into the beer at the end of the wort line um, so that you know. And, and monitoring your fermentation is just the oxygen for, for beers that you brew all the time. How important is rehydration of a lalum and dry yeast for a home brewer before they um, brew their beer? It's, uh, we have a best practice that uh, actually we can send to you in order for people that want to reiterate. So, because if you want to do it, you have to do it correctly, otherwise it's better not to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, especially like doing it in water, uh, not in uh, not in wort. You don't want to stress and to prepare already the yeast. Uh, yeah. Actually, so we used to say that it was better to reiterate, but uh, it has changed uh, this, past, uh, this past times. Uh, as now with the progress, with the quality of the yeast, how we produce it. So, uh, and really, we had we made some different tests uh, on all our yeast, and the results was uh, that it was uh, in terms of we have been looking on um, uh, the last att the attenuation, the final attenuation, and uh, and also the lag phase. So these two uh, parameters, and we haven't seen any difference, uh, reduction or no reduction. So like uh, like my uh, Spanish colleague used to uh, used to tell me, life is too short. So just uh, just uh, pitch, uh, pitch the yeast, unless you have a uh, high gravity warts or uh, sour condition where rehydration uh, could uh, help. We get a lot of customers asking us, what's the difference between dry yeast, like Lalaman's dry yeast, and liquid yeast? Um, and, and is one better than the other? Back in the day, the drying technology of dry yeast was dried, you know, uh, first and foremost for, for baking. And uh, yeah. for baking, you don't have a, as high quality specifications. So that's kind of how dry yeast got a bad name. Now we've progressed very, very far in the technology of drying. And also we've got very strict um, certificate of analysis thresholds for any contamination in the rest. So that's usually where a lot of the negativity um, for dry yeast uh, comes from, it is, is, is back in the day, the, the cross-contamination. Um, we do so many tests on uh, the dry yeast to make sure that there is no contamination. Everything from, um, you know, mini fermentation tests, uh, gas chromatograph tests, microbiology, DNA tests, um, the whole lot. Um, so, you know, dry is, is far greater these days than, than the rapid used to have. Um, you know, we recommend up to five generations repitching. Um, some people will repitch more. Um, and the thing about dry yeast is very convenient that, you um, uh, basically, you've got a long shelf life, right? You can leave it in the fridge, you can leave it in the freezer for, for a long time. It's always there. It's in stasis. So liquid yeast, it's going to still be needing some feed because it's not in stasis. So, I mean, they are shipped with a bit of food, but when that food runs out, it, it's, it's the shelf life is not as long. You know, that's um, one of the key benefits of, of, of dry yeast. Is there a guidelines for, say, some tips and tricks and methods for home brewers if they did want to get more than one brew out of their lalum and yeast? Yep. So, I mean, with anything, you just want to, you want to monitor. So you want to monitor how that fermentation's going, whether it's creating um, diacetyl and there's very simple ways to do the diacetyl test. Um, you know, you just, you want to monitor those fermentations and health. I mean, I don't think many home brewers would be doing microbiology. I don't know. 
Um, but depending on the yeast, um, the, the culture that you have, um, it, they can last last a lot longer. I mean, I, in my past life, one of the brewing roles I had, I ran a continuous propagator where we would pitch yeast in, um, pitch yeast out, and then we would top up with wort. And we ran that for um, three months before we had any uh, contamination or VDK issues. And it just depends on the yeast strain, your process, all of the rest of the things. Um, but the main thing is just to, to monitor that, to, to check those fermentation graphs and, and um, you know, see if, if the yeast has always been reabsorbing the diacetyl in one day and suddenly now it's five days, well, that culture is, is, is probably getting on. The other question we get sometimes is say someone's going on, on holidays or, um, you know, they're busy, they haven't got around to kegging or bottling their beer. How long can they leave their homebrew on, say, um, an ale yeast um, before, you know, there'll be some degradation, mycotolysis. Well, yeast autolysis is basically the yeast cell wall bursting open, right? Releasing some some various compounds and acids and, and, and off flavors. That's what yeast autolysis is. Um, again, it, it depends on, on that yeast, uh, how long its, its storage reserves are going to last. Um, I mean, in, in brewing, I would always be yeasting off a little bit every day. Um, and you can see when that, you know, in, in, in a brewing fermenter, you can see when that yeast changes from brown to white. Um, personally, I wouldn't leave it on yeast. You know, when we talk about storing yeast, we say four Celsius for two weeks. Um, but again, then, you know, strains like uh, Voss, for example, um, it, it, it could be longer. Um, it, it's really a matter of, um, I'm always best practice and best practice is to, is to rack that beer off the yeast when fermentation is finished. Can you make a yeast starter with a dry yeast? Um, and if um, you can, what would be your recommendation to a home brewer if maybe they wanted to boost the cell count for a high ABV beer or something like that? Keep more packets. <laughs> Uh, no, look, starters are good. Again, you 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 want to you want to monitor that. So if you're doing a cell count um, and you're using that calculator on the website, then um, you uh, will know where your starters at. I guess uh, home brewers will work out a lot of their own methods for starters. Right? They'll have a they'll have a process that they follow each time. Um, yeah, I mean, it is easy to do starters, but again, the more that you, um, you know, rehydrate or create starters, the more risk of, of infection happens. Start with the right amount of yeast if you can, rather than, than make starters. There shouldn't be a need to with, with dried yeast. You can do starters if you want. If you, if, you, if you want to boost what you've got, making sure everything's sanitary, yeah, you can create a starter. The rule is usually one in ten. Another thing to note about um, starters as well, um, when you're propagating yeast, uh, warmer is usually better, around 30, 40 Celsius. Right. You're going to get more biomass generated. Or if you're uh, feeling very confident about keeping it sanitary, uh, go for it if that's what makes you comfortable. But, uh, you know, otherwise it's just another opportunity for con contamination, like, like Dan said. What about forced fermentation, Erin? Is that something that home brewers need to think about um, in terms of where's my beer going to finish. We do occasionally get people say, oh, I, I, I used this brewing software and I thought it was going to finish at 10.10 and it stopped at 10.18. Really, uh, what, I, what I've seen is that uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most uh, useful uh, stuff to do uh, yeah. as a professional brewer or also home brewer. Uh, yeah. useful and also interesting because it's uh, so the first fermentation test it means that uh, you need to take uh, a small amount of uh, your wort and yeah. uh, lots of amount of yeast and you do that you do that uh, on the same you begin that on the same day as you began your fermentation and so it's going to be quicker so in 24 hours you you la you'll have your final attenuation and this is the figure that you need to reach with your um, whole fermentation. So this is yeah. very interesting to follow. And uh, if you don't have the same, so you can question yourself. Okay, what's happening? Uh, what did I? Uh, uh, so this is really uh, a, a very um, uh, good stuff to do to better understand your fermentation uh, and all your production process.